Stefan Bauman's The Grand View is funded in part by Plein Air Magazine for people who love painting outdoors. PlenAirMagazine.com And by Masterpiece Canvas Makers of fine art canvases We supply the canvas You supply the vision And by PaintingFromNature.com a website for artists seeking inspiration, advice, and knowledge to master painting from nature. Paintingfromnature.com In 1872, a series of battles erupted between the U.S. Army and the native Modoc people following attempts to relocate the Modoc tribe to a reservation in southern Oregon. Unwilling to reside at the reservation, a band of 30 Modoc warriors began resisting the efforts of the U.S. government and fortified their stand near Tule Lake, California. Following great losses, the U.S. Army increased their battle forces to over 1,000 soldiers. During peace negotiations in March of 1873, a U.S. general and a peace negotiator were killed. The U.S. government responded resolutely and began an aggressive campaign against the remaining Modoc warriors. By October, the 1,000 U.S. troops were able to capture Captain Jack and his five Modoc warriors, and they were sentenced to death by hanging. My name is Stefan Bauman, and welcome to The Grand View. Just south of Oregon on the California border lies Lava Beds National Monument. This place offers sweeping views of Shasta and over 400 lava tubes to explore. It's also where the Modoc tribe and white settlers had one of their fiercest battles. So come along with us as we explore this fascinating and wonderful place called Lava Beds National Monument. These are the things my grandmother told me and my grandfather told me and some of the other old Indians told me. I was a boy, I didn't go to school very much. I went to the seventh grade, but that was all. And then I went to work and when I used to go to work, I used to stop and talk to old people because I was told to do that. And they said, when you're not working and you ain't got time to spare, you go to some old people and maybe pack up a little water for them or maybe cut a little wood for them, and they will talk to you. So I done it. And that's where I learned all these old things that I tell about, and they all told the same story. Because when the, well, say when the old coyote came over, I'll tell you a story now. <laughs> he came over on his boat, and uh, he looked at the country, and he said, my, this is a pretty place. I'm going to have it but I gotta find the people first. So he looked for the people, but he couldn't reach them. So he said to the people, he hollered up to them, they lived on a higher level than he did. 
So he hollered up to him, said, I am traveling. I'm following the sun. I want to know where it goes. But I'm hungry, he said. If you'll give me one of your childs to eat, he said, I'll eat that, and then I won't bother you no more. But if you don't give it to me, I'll come up there and kill all of you. So the people talked it over, and they gave him one. So he ate that and left. A long time afterwards, he came back. He said, I couldn't get across the other side. The water was too far. I couldn't get across, and I didn't have my boat. So I'm going to go home now, he said. But I'm hungry again. Give me one more of your children. I'll eat that, and then I'll leave. So they said, well, if you're going to leave, we'll give you that. You can go. So he took that, and he ate it, and he left. Pretty quick, he came back again. He said, I forgot where I left my boat. If you'll give me one more of your children to eat, I'll do that, and then I'll leave. I'll remember then. But they never gave him that. That's why he's still here. The coyote is a lot of things. He's not just one little animal. But our people use the animal name because the coyote is a very smart animal. You can catch him in a trap once, and you'll never catch him again. Life. Not a violent life. I want a peaceful life for people. That's what I've been working for for years and years and years. the largest reclamation project in the history of this country, at least up, in that, up until that time, began in the early 1900s, and that was the uh, draining of, uh, of Tule Lake. It was fertile land, fertile, fertile land, of course, with 20 or 30 feet of duck muck uh, under there, the accumulation of thousands of years. That's some pretty darn good fertilizer. And uh, so there's still a lake there, but it's just a fraction of what it, what it was before. And they had a uh, lottery. Uh, World War I and World War II veterans were allowed to be part of this lottery where they would give away homesteads to the winners. And so there have been generation after generation of homesteaders out in this area. And part of that uh, reclamation project provided uh, these folks with, with land. Uh, Judd Howard, an old fella who came out here in the well, he came out in 1916 and explored all through the 1920s and into the 30s. He's known as the father of lava beds. He had a great passion for this place. I feel that I have some of that same passion. Uh, crawled around, uh, made some of these openings a lot larger so he could bring people out here to go through these caves. Devoted his life to this place. Wrote letters to Congress and the President, beginning with Wilson and through Harding and finally Coolidge. Uh, uh, made this place into a national monument in 1925. People that find their way to Lava Beds National Monument generally really have to go out of their way to arrive here. But an odd, an odd thing about that, people who do get here for the first time, you know, they always tend to come back again. We've just begun in earnest to um, inventory. We've got the basic information that we need, but um, to get more in depth and provide more information on, on uh, the species that we may not know exist, we have brought some professionals into the park to do uh, an inventory of mammals and plants in the park. Um, we have a very large variety of um, uh, lava tube caves in the park. and. Uh, those caves contain a vast amount of information that we have yet to tap in terms of uh, inventory monitoring um, of the resources in the caves as well as uh, 
some hidden um, unknown aspects of, of the cave environment, uh, uh, animals and or um, uh, other types of, of life that may inhabit the caves that we don't know about. Petrular Point is an inholding in the monument that's actually separate from the monument and um, it's a, a volcanic um, a geologic formation that uh, um, is unique in respect that uh, uh, when it formed it actually came up through the what was at that time the um, area of Tule Lake or, or of, of the lake that is now Tule Lake and as it came up through the water um, the um, rock um, as soon as it hit the cooler water would expand very ra rapidly and therefore um, a lot of the uh, formations on the surface of the uh, the uh, rock itself are very porous and very very pocketed uh, which is a prime roosting habitat for the uh, eagles and, and other per, uh, birds of prey. We get approximately 15 inches of rain a year which is not a lot to sustain the ecosystem around here but the ecosystem has adapted to not having that type of uh, influx of water in the area um, and the majority of precipitation we get usually is in the form of snow uh, in the winter time um, and then uh, throughout the summertime, which is our dry period, we get occasional rain showers, but not very often. Lava beds is a class one air shed, which is, which is a very um, clean uh, quality of air that we have in the area here. So when one first visits the area, one might get an idea that uh, the diversity is rather limited because of the l landscape being um, a semi-arid landscape. It's um, not quite as diverse as perhaps the redwoods or um, you know areas similar to that so um, but the thing that really strikes me is the the stark beauty of the area it's something that until you really are able to explore and uh, better understand through exploring an area like this Lava Beds National Monument is a park that needs to be experienced by foot, so you need to step out of your car, put on a good pair of hiking boots, and walk around. And what I found exceptionally beautiful about this park are some of the trees, and especially early in the morning, like this morning. It's a fabulous morning for painting. There's not a breeze in the air, there's not a cloud in the sky. And so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to squeeze out my ultramarine blue, my alizarin crimson, and my cad yellow. And we're going to start sketching and I'm going to concentrate on the tree itself first. I'm going to start off with the trunk and I want to get a feeling for this tree even before I start the rest of my sketch. I want to be sure that I place it properly in my canvas. It's a little less than a third in. Now I'm going to pay very close attention to the little sky holes that are peeking through. A lot of times these trees are fascinating by the trunks but the, this cypress-like foliage that grows on the top of the tree just captivated me when I saw it. One of the fascinating things about this place is the rocks. There's incredible rock sculptures here and as you wander around them you get the sense of just this magnificent force of these volcanoes and this lava that have flown through this area and we're actually standing on top of a lava bed here. Speaking of which, I'm going to put some of these lava shapes in. Now I'm going to concentrate on putting the shadows in on these rocks. And the color that's there I'm going to leave for the highlight. And one thing you'll notice is that the light is changing constantly when you're working outdoors. So what I'm putting in is what I call footnotes. These are just little moments in time that I see at this very moment. There's actually a canyon of shadow. And I like that right now. I like the feeling of the light hitting this area of rocks. And I'm just going to put a thin layer of this brown color I mixed up. What I'm doing here is I'm pushing back and forth until I get the mountain feeling like where I want it. Now this mountain also is not the main focal point and I'm going to try not to put a lot of detail into it. Just turpentine in my three colors. I'm going to put in my shadows on my tree. I'm going to leave my sketch actually as part of my painting. I'm 
There's this wonderful knot. This branch coming out. It's all twisted and knotted. Now with my sketch done, I'm ready to start painting. And around my branches, those little tiny holes. And I'm going to switch to a smaller brush just so that I can get around my detail. I spend too much time on my sketch not to use it for my, for my painting. Now towards the top of my painting, I want to introduce a lot more blue and actually make it quite dark. I want to darken the corners. By darkening the corner of my painting, it will help bring the viewer to the center of my painting. It's all about light and we want to direct the viewer's light or the viewer's eye to the center of my painting. We're going to do that with light. And in order to do that, we have to have contrast. So I'm going to darken the edges of my canvas. Okay, now with our sky done, we're just about ready to start working on our mountain. I'm going to add yellow and blue. And just drag it in the direction of your mountain. Use lots of paint. The birds in the distance always kind of put a smile on my face. I love listening to the wildlife when I'm working outdoors. I want to try to capture what I saw this morning. It's a little bit later, the light's a little bit flatter. And what I remember this morning is that there was a lot more brown in my mountain and the light was strong, really bright in here. And I darken it just by adding a little bit of blue and some vertical strokes because the rocks on the mountain are vertical so they'll go down straight up and down. Now the little trees that are sitting on the mountain are the same intensity of color but they're darker which means that they're, the value is the same as the, the mountain itself. They're lighter than the trees in the foreground. So I'm going to introduce a lot more blue to this color and yellow and a little bit of red. Now load up the brush pretty heavily. Just use the corner of the brush and you can see you just kind of dab it. Now with our background trees done, we're ready to start working on our mid-ground trees. Now these trees are very soft and I don't want a lot of detail. The idea is to keep the viewer focused on the foreground. So this area will lay in very softly, again with our mixture of green. Just take this soft color and just hit the canvas with the same brush. If you notice, we're not using a lot of brushes. This is a cool green. Now these rocks are real dark and the sagebrush just lights up around them. That bright light. Just with a flick of the brush. Same brush we've been using. I love painting sagebrush. I love the color and I love the texture that it has. Okay, now with all of these trees in in the middle ground. We're going to put a few of these little rocks in the middle ground also. These rocks are predominantly a brown color and they're reddish brown, almost a purple or a plum color. And since they're in the distance, we want to put just little short strokes back and forth. So what we want to do is get all the shadows in first. This is a lot of ultramarine blue with uh, my yellow and red. I want this whole corner to be shadowed. And part of the issue that I'm dealing with right now is not to make the rocks too detailed. We have to keep in mind that the main focal point of this painting is the tree. Now the viewers are going to be more interested in the lights as opposed to the shadow. So spend some time worrying about your highlights. Okay, now with the rocks done, we're going to start focusing on the sagebrush. We're going to switch to a fan brush. And we're going to mix that same light color that we used in the distance, except a little bit more white. So dab the brush straight onto the canvas and flick upwards to give the feeling of the sagebrush. And this will help also cut apart the rocks a little bit. To the left here, there's some more. So 
sagebrush. You get this wonderful bright bluish light. It's the same color I was using with a little bit more white in it. And see how that just brightens up the whole painting? It just changes the whole feeling of all these rocks. All of a sudden this area doesn't look so desolate. In essence, we're working with this fan brush. We're just going to take a darker variation of this color using the fan brush. Just going to use the corner. And just very carefully recreate the tree. I'm also blurring some of these strokes as I put them on. Just dragging them to the left and to the right or down. I'm going to actually put a little bit of foliage out away from the, the branch itself and then put little tiny branches to it. And now use the same stroke over on the right hand tree. And we want to get all the darks in. Again, leave a lot of the sky holes. Blend a little bit on the edges. Try to pick up the main characteristic of the tree. Remember, we made this tree a little bit smaller. And now with our darks in, it's time to do our highlights. And I'm going to mix blue and yellow together to create a nice bright green. And I'm going to mix them together with my fan brush. And using the same stroke, I'm going to apply the highlights on. I'm just going to dance a little highlight on top of these darks. And right in here I'm going to make it just a little bit brighter. Even brighter than on the top of my tree. Again we want to make this the main focal area. And now we bring the same color and bring the bright on this tree. Again, don't do too much. Only about 50%. If you want your tree to look very amateurish, Paint the whole thing in bright light. Okay, now with our highlights done on our tree, we're ready to start putting in some of the branches. And I have to say, this is one of my favorite parts of every painting I do. I'm a detailist. I love seeing the little details. And working with a small little brush and just exploring these little branches and how they attach themselves to the foliage really makes me excited. And we'll go right over the orange paint. These trees have a little bit of orange in them, but not a lot, so we're going to actually repaint the trunks. And now I'm going to take that same dark color, bring it right down my trunk. This is all the detail. This is the part I love so much. Just take your time. This is our main focal point, so we want to spend some time making sure that the detail is absolutely wonderful. And we can also make a few minor corrections by adding some more sky holes using the same brush very carefully. And now we'll do the tree on the right hand side. Just bring the trunk through. Not a lot of the trunk is showing. And I want to put a little bit of the details on top of the sagebrush. And now with all the little details done, we're ready to sign the painting. Expanded instructional DVDs that feature an hour-long demonstration of today's painting and other paintings in the series are available at The Grand View by calling 1-800-511-1337. Join us on our website, thegrandview.org, and get more information about our show. 
There you can download our free book, Everything You Need to Know About Outdoor Painting, along with a free diagram of today's subject. Stefan Bauman's The Grand View is funded in part by PaintingFromNature.com A website for artists seeking inspiration, advice, and knowledge to master painting from nature. PaintingFromNature.com And by Masterpiece Canvas Makers of fine art canvases We supply the canvas You supply the vision And by Plein Air Magazine for people who love painting outdoors. Plein Air Magazine dot com.